Let us call ourselves to worship with words from the 31st Psalm. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to me, to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Please join in our prayer of confession. Risen Christ, you prepare a place for us in the home of the mother and father of us all. Draw us more deeply into yourself. Through scripture read, water splashed, bread broken, wine poured, so that when our hearts are troubled, we will know you more completely as the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Our opening hymn is Savior, Source of Every Blessing. Let us pray together. Gracious God and lover of all creation, we come to you with hearts that are heavy and minds that are confused. We hear and see a constant jabber of misinformation, bad science, bad theology, that have us questioning the ability of your people to live in community as you have directed. We hear cries calling for reviving our economy even at the expense of human lives. We understand the financial pain and fear that leads to thoughts that someone must be conspiring to hurt us. We even hear that you, our God, have sent this virus as a punishment. We know a virus is a virus and not something that you have sent to kill and destroy, not some dark conspiracy. We know our response to pain and suffering must be to be lovingly present for all who are feeling that pain offering hope and serving with joy. But it is difficult, particularly when our physical presence can put people at risk. Help us to persevere. Help us to be strong. Help us to know that you are with us in these dark times, giving us the patience to wade through the mixed messages we are hearing daily, so that we may respond to the needs of others with clear thoughts and actions based on love. Heal the suffering that leads to anger and frustration. Calm the irrational thoughts that infect us as surely as the virus. Keep hope alive. Shine your light in all our darkness. And now take this time to offer your prayers. We ask all of this in great confidence that you will respond with your loving grace in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading is the story of the stoning of Stephen from the book of Acts. 
And you can imagine how I felt as a child when I learned from my parents that this was the guy I had been named after. Here is the text. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Our Gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. One. Philip wants hard evidence. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Now one must presume that the implication of this request is that without such evidence, Philip and the other disciples, since he says we will be satisfied, he appears he is speaking for the entire group. Without hard evidence, they will not be satisfied. We seem to make the same demand of Jesus today. We're a science-based culture. We're used to demanding to see physical proof of everything. We even have one of our states, Missouri, that's nicknamed the Show Me State. And the most popular story regarding this nickname revolves around remarks made by a U.S. congressman, Willard Duncan Vandeveer, who served as a member of the U.S. House Committee on Naval Affairs. Now, Mr. Vandeveer was a scholar, a writer, a lecturer, and he even had a passing res resemblance to Mark Twain. And once he was speaking to Philadelphia's Five O'Clock Club, and in questioning the accuracy of another uh, speaker's remarks, he concluded that I come from a state that grows corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats. And frothy eloquence neither convinces me nor satisfies me. I'm from Missouri. 
You've got to show me. Now, that seems close to the demand that Jesus was placing on, uh, Philip was placing on Jesus, saying the Father and Spirit, claiming that the Father dwelt in him, was not convincing enough for Philip. Show us the Father, he demanded. So how do you show Spirit? Jesus tells metaphors about God. God is the rock. God is the good shepherd. The psalmist calls God our sun and our shield. Jesus also uses metaphors to describe himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. And you are the branches. Clearly, Jesus was not a loaf of bread. But he often compares himself and our relationship with God in the form of sharing bread with one another. He's talking about sharing the sustaining essence of life with one another. Serving bread becomes a metaphor for serving one another with love. He uses this rather intriguing metaphor, lamenting how he has failed to reach the people who need to hear his voice. He says, how often I have longed to gather our children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Oddly, we seem to have reached a time in history where facts don't seem to matter. But I submit that that might be a misreading of what's actually happening right now. Facts are still important. The argument is not that facts are irrelevant. It's a fight about whose facts are real and whose facts are, quote, fake, unquote. And we're still a fact-based culture. It's just that everyone seems inclined to believe a particular set of facts, whether they're based on any real evidence or not. In other words, we still would be asking Jesus to show us the Father. But everyone would be seeing a different photo of what the Father looks like. It's like different preachers claiming that we know what Jesus would do in our modern world or what God looks like in terms of how we deal with modern issues. We even have an Ohio State representative who refuses to wear a mask during a pandemic because he figures that people look like God because the Bible says that we are made in God's image. And so wearing a mask covers God's face. That's interesting theology. Jesus is making a completely different statement. You can't see the face of God. God is spirit. Saying that human beings are made in the image of God is, like everything else we say about God, a metaphor. You can't see the face of God. You can only see what God is like through the ways in which the Father makes an appearance in the works and teachings of human beings. For Christian, that image is Christ, the accepted metaphor for the image of God. And even in the case of Jesus, we tend to want to paint an actual picture of Jesus. We see him too often as tall and slim and white and often blue-eyed with long blonde hair and a beard. And, and yet the man from Nazareth was probably dark-skinned, short, squat, based on the fact that he was criticized for being a glutton, with dark eyes, dark hair, likely short hair, and no beard, based on the fact that beards and short hair were common at the time. Oh, and note that Jesus was critical of those who wore long robes, which in his time was an indication of flaunting wealth. So it seems likely his own attire would have been shorter than he's generally depicted. Now, if you saw the depiction of the televised Jesus, uh, Jesus, of Jesus Christ superstar, the portrayal by John Legend was probably a better approximation of the physical Jesus than the images we've been using in our Sunday school classrooms. Still, that's only an educated guess. Arguing over what Jesus looked like is another way we miss the point. We don't know what Jesus looks like, and it doesn't matter. Our Muslim brothers and sisters solved the issue with their own prophet Muhammad by prohibiting any depiction of him. But Christians will, I am confident, keep spinning out examples of what we think Jesus did or could or should look like. I can't think that Jesus would consider that to be a good thing. Jesus is calling on Philip to look a little deeper at him. 
He wants Philip to see the Spirit of God revealed in him. That's not revealed through the color of his eyes or the tone of his skin or the length of his hair and beard or the hem of the length of his robe. It's revealed in Christ's loving spirit and service to the oppressed. It's revealed in his power to heal and his willingness to stand up against evil. See those things in Jesus and you can see the Father. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Unlike the disciples who knew exactly what Jesus looked like, we only have the message of his words and deeds to go on. It's probably unfortunate that, that we also have the almost certainly unrepresentative images of Jesus from art and movies. Those images tend to reinforce our need for the hard evidence of the Father and the Son that we long for. We grab onto an image rather than the spirit behind the message and the hard and painful suffering that were so much part of the life and teaching of Jesus and give so much power to this story. The wistful, peaceful images welcoming Christ welcoming the children that belies the scandal of allowing children and the unkempt and the lame and the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the Samaritans to join him in his ministry. Show us the Father. The Father is revealed in the struggles of Jesus, the radical attack on extravagant wealth, the clash with the ruling class of both the government and the temple, the ministry to the outcast and the downtrodden and the contempt for the hypocrisy. These are the things that reveal the Father who lived in Jesus. There are no photos or movies of the Father. God's not calling any press conferences. What God is doing is revealing the Spirit in countless acts of compassion and love daily. That is Christ's Spirit shining through. It's shining through Christians and Muslims and Jews and atheists and sinners and doubters and believers. I often wish it was something we saw more often in the folks who call themselves followers of Christ. God's Spirit is not about what denomination or nationality or race you are associated with or about your IQ or your musical ability or any physical or mental impairment you might have. The face of God shows up in how people serve one another with love. May we allow the face of God to be seen in our own face through our service. May it be so. Amen.
May God's blessing be with you throughout the week ahead. And may that blessing go out to all God's people through you and your presence. Amen.